All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cadet Sam Coling, and I'm excited to talk to you today about some ideas I've been studying for a while and that I find both very interesting and important. The title of my presentation is Forget Everything You Know About Character. My thesis, the big idea of this talk, can be summed up in the following three points. One, character traits are far more rare and significantly less robust than we would like to believe. Two, seemingly insignificant situational factors have much more to do with moral decisions than was previously understood. Three, embracing and applying this knowledge as an organizational leader can be a force multiplier. In short, character as you and I have always known it does not exist. In academic philosophy and psychology, this position is known as situationism. It's uncomfortable at first, but I think applying it can make us more effective people. So let's talk about this status quo theory of character ethics. The incumbent theory of ethics uses this kind of terminology. I think it'll be familiar to you. Everyone has traits. Traits are something that is true about you. Some of those traits are personality traits, which describe the way you interact with other people. For instance, energetic, calm, serious. Of those personality traits, some of them are what we call morally relevant, which means that having them makes you a good person or a bad person. For instance, honesty, kindness, cruelty. Having those makes you a good person or a bad person in a way that serious, calm, and energetic does not. We call those character traits. That's what we mean when we say character traits. So let's talk about this status quo theory of ethics. The traditional line of thinking goes something like this. You have an individual. They possess character traits. They carry them around with them from situation to situation throughout their day. If you want to say something about, for instance, Jill, and say that Jill is honest, what you're saying is that she tells the truth throughout her day, she doesn't mislead anyone, and she's been that way for a while. If you say that Jack is angry, you're saying that he is prone to outbursts of rage disproportionate to the situation. He's probably been that way for a while too. So really what you're saying about honesty and anger is two things. One, that they are consistent across situations. And two, that they are exhibited over time consistently, what we call time endurance. Unfortunately, as intuitive as this is, I do not think it is correct. Research suggests that it is incorrect. That is a difficult claim to make for this reason. The people up here are who I call the old guard of character ethics. Aristotle, on the left, was the original character ethicist in ancient Greece. Now, he influenced, with his character ethics philosophy, the philosophers on the right, who incorporated into major world religions this character theory and built it into the moral teachings of their religion. For instance, in the upper left, Al-Farabi, Muslim philosopher. In the upper right, Avicenna, Muslim philosopher. In the lower left, St. Thomas Aquinas, Catholic philosopher. And in the lower right, Maimonides, a Sephardic Jewish scholar. Each of them built Aristotle's character ethics into their own moral philosophies. Now, if you look at a map of the world, you see that each of the religions I just mentioned have covered pretty much the entire globe, with the exception of East Asia, the green and yellow countries up there. Which means that for a thousand years, most of the world has been raising their children on an ethical theory that was inspired by Aristotelian character ethics. That's why it's hard to argue against character. It's an assumption. It's difficult to argue against it for the same reason that a fish doesn't know that it's wet. Character talk is all we've ever really known in the Western world. These people are trying to change that. They are the situationists. They are unique because they have a background in experimental psychology and spend their time researching human moral behavior. They've conducted a lot of interesting experiments, some of which have surprising results. I'm going to talk about those experiments and then at the end state the big takeaway from those experiments. First, the Milgram shock experiment. This experiment consisted of a subject being told that he or she was to conduct a learning test with a learner who's actually an experimenter. The learner would sit on the opposite side of a large electric shock apparatus, pictured right there. For the record, this is a picture from the movie The Experimenter. came out October last year. does a very good job of showing the electric shock apparatus. It's not actually Stanley Milgram, although it looks like him. 
Good movie, recommend it. The learner sits on the other side of the electric shock apparatus, who's actually an experimenter, right? Every time the learner answers a question wrong, the subject is told to administer a shock as punishment to increase the learning, supposedly. The shock increases in voltage from 15 volts up to 450 volts, deadly levels, enough to kill a human being. At about 300 volts level, the learner will cry out in pain and beg to leave the experiment. Sometime after that, the learner will kick the wall and make no further noises, simulating death or seizure. Now what's shocking is that 66%, two out of every three of those subjects, administered every single shock right up to the deadly levels. And 100% of the subjects administered two-thirds of all the shocks. And the only variable correlated with them going to those extremes was the presence of a man in a lab coat sitting behind them, politely urging them to continue. So what's the main takeaway? The average human will do what he or she is told to do by a person in perceived authority. The Stanford Prison Experiment. In the 1970s, Philip Zimbardo wanted to study the way that roles affect human behavior. So he got a group of college students, divided them in two, and assigned them roles arbitrarily, prisoners and guards. He then put them into a mock prison in the basement of a Stanford psychology building and told them to simply carry out their duties to the guards, maintain good order and discipline in the prison for two weeks. The experiment had to be terminated after six days because entirely of their own accord, the guards subjected the prisoners to so much mental and emotional abuse that they began having mental breakdowns, yes, mental breakdowns at a rate of about one person per day. The only variable correlated with the guards going to those extremes was the assignment of the role, prisoner or guard. Everything else was controlled for. So what's the main takeaway? The average human wants to exercise authority in a role, even to a fault. Now, those are some classic studies you've probably heard of before. This one's a little less known, but it's very interesting. The dime in the phone booth experiment. Researchers wanted to know how much being in a good mood affects your ethical disposition, namely to help pick up papers from a stranger drops in front of you in a train station. So what they did was start leaving dimes in the coin return slots of telephone booths in this train station. The way it would work is a, a subject, a stranger, would walk up, enter the phone booth, make the call, hang up, find the dime in the coin return slot, and exit the phone booth at which point the experimenter would drop their papers, scattering in front of the individual exiting the phone booth. Experimenters recorded how many of those people exiting the phone booth stopped to help pick up those papers. What they found was shocking. Of the individuals who found the coin in the coin return slot, 93% stopped to help pick up the papers. Of the individuals who did not find the coin in the coin return slot, 4% stopped to help. So what's the takeaway? The average human will act more morally, will be kinder, and will be nicer if they're in a good mood. So there's plenty of these studies. I'm going to go through a few of them that are, I think, pretty interesting, but for interest of time, uh, a little faster. In the upper left, researchers from Princeton demonstrated that 90% of all people will walk right by a person in medical distress clearly in need of an ambulance if they are in a hurry. In the upper right, researchers from Newcastle University in the UK demonstrated that that pair of eyes, if posted prominently in a break room, can reduce instances of break room theft by 66%. <laughs> in the lower right, Dan Ariely, a researcher from, Cornell, or from excuse me, Duke University, demonstrated that the average human will be more disposed to lie and cheat if they are hungry or tired, that actually skipping dinner will make you less ethical. And in the lower left, researchers from Cornell discovered that the average human will report more conservative political opinions and evaluate ethical questions more harshly if they are standing within 10 feet of a hand sanitizer dispenser.
Now, more and more of these studies are being published every month, and it bodes ill for that status quo theory of character that we're all used to. Things that shouldn't matter in our moral decision-making process simply do. And at first, that's very uncomfortable. But we can put this information to good use. A leader, a leader who understands the influence of the situation on human moral behavior will be able to make their organizations more ethical. And that's important. So let's consider an example that we're all familiar with, the armed forces. The military is unique in the way that it can control for situational variables to a much greater extent than your average company. Your average corporation cannot make everyone wear the same clothes and stand facing the same direction at the position of attention for a photo. The military can. That matters. So what I've done is try and take from each experiment that we just talked about a principle that can be used by an organizational leader to make the organization more effective, whether they're in the Army or not. So here's what I've come up with. The Milgram shock experiment can tell us to understand and use wisely the power that the mere perception of authority is capable of exerting. With power comes responsibility. The Stanford prison experiment can tell us to capitalize on the human urge to fulfill roles with clear expectations and limitations. Don't address your soldiers just by their last names. Address them by their rank. See how they perform. The dime in the phone booth experiment can tell us that if you can find a way to brighten your soldier's day, they will behave more ethically. The Princeton hurry experiment can tell us that we ought not unduly rush our subordinates to accomplish a task unless it's absolutely necessary lest we risk them behaving unethically. The Newcastle break room eyes experiment can tell us that people will behave more ethically if they feel like they're being supervised. So supervise. Be around. Be visible. Be an engaged leader. They'll behave more ethically. And Dan Ariely's dishonesty and fatigue experiment can tell us take care of your soldiers. Well rested well-fed and de-stressed soldiers will make more moral decisions. Now that's just what I've come up with so far. I'm going to have to close. So to restate the thesis, the three points. One, character traits are far more rare and significantly less robust than we would like to believe. Two, seemingly insignificant situational factors have much more to do with moral decisions than was previously understood. Three, embracing and applying this knowledge as an organizational leader can be a force multiplier. Now I'll leave you with an analogy that really stuck with me about this topic. Apples used to be transported primarily in barrels, and many of those apples would go bad and need to be thrown away. And it took a long time for the shipping companies to realize that it was not the apples themselves that were going bad, but the barrels in which they were being shipped that had tainted the cargo. We are at risk of making that same mistake, not with apples and barrels, but with people and situations. A good organizational leader that wants ethical conduct from their subordinates must understand that there are not so many bad people as there are bad situations. A good leader must not worry only about the apples, but also about the barrels. Thank you.